Bob Olson, Chief Operating Officer with IKEA, here to say uh, hey, a Swedish way of uh, saying good morning or hi uh, and connecting. Um, really excited to uh, spend some time with you guys this morning. Um, hopefully you had a chance yesterday to get acclimated. Not sure if you got to the brewery tour or not. I missed that one, but I heard it was good. And then uh, quite inspired with uh, Ryan uh, last night uh, and his uh, approach on uh, Stoic, uh, and I take that into Stoic leadership. And I think you'll see some of uh, what we're talking about uh, coming true in his words uh, from last night as well. So excited to take you through. Maybe first uh, to start, uh, you know, when you look at all the change that is going on in uh, retail, all of us are trying to adapt and, and work within that. And I think, like Ryan said, uh, in order to stay the same, everything must change. And uh, that's a phase that we're all in right now. The one thing that has never changed for us is we started as a uh, mail order company over 40, I'm sorry, over 80 years ago, uh, is our vision. Our vision is uh, to create a better everyday life for the many people. And that is something that has stuck with us uh, from the onset and that we continue uh, to work with as we go forward. We came into the United States uh, almost 40 years ago, back in June of 1985, opening up just outside of Philadelphia in the Plymouth Meeting Mall, uh, and have grown quite a bit since then, with uh, 51 store locations now across the US, uh, seven what we call plan and order points, uh, growing uh, quite rapidly. We'll talk about those in a few seconds as well. Um, and then also trying to see how do we move uh, and get uh, closer to the consumer in many different ways. With our vision to create a better everyday life, we do so in the home. So we do so by offering a wide range of well-designed uh, functional home furnishing products at prices so low that as many uh, people as possible will be able to afford them. And I'm going to take you into what we call the three roads. And you can hear a little bit of that in this uh, statement as well. The three roads that we lead towards our vision on is affordability, accessibility, and sustainability. So obviously, with the title of the uh, uh, session, I will hit sustainability, but I'll end with that one. And we'll go in a little bit to affordability and uh, accessibility first. From an affordability standpoint, we do so focused on what we call democratic design. It has five uh, components that go along with it, where we focus on uh, quality, form, function, price, and uh, sustainability. As I mentioned, we started as a mail order company uh, many years ago and have quickly evolved into one of the leading home furnishing uh, companies across the globe. When we dig into the affordability side, the way we have done that uh, is uh, being uh, pretty much vertically integrated as a company, where we're able to start all the way from the design side of the range to uh, actually selling it on the floor and everything in between uh, with the consumer. And uh, from that affordability piece, we do so by continually engineering, getting on the shop floor, uh, the factory floor with uh, our suppliers to see how can we be better tomorrow than we are today. I actually had an opportunity back in um, 2006, seven, and eight to work on part of a global group called Lean Retailing, where we took this type of approach, looked at every product, see how does it break down, how can we adapt, adjust to uh, make it uh, more uh, cost effective for our customer at the end of the day. So we were able to take products that uh, might fit 10 on a pallet, and then tomorrow we were able to fit 11 on a pallet. So if you can think of the uh, scope of sending products across the globe, whether it be ocean transport, whether it be ground transport, um, or any other facet, if you can increase how many you put on a pallet by 10%, you've just saved a huge uh, transportation cost. At the same time, looking at raw materials, we've all seen, as, especially as we went through COVID, the uh, increase of uh, raw material prices and the impact that that's had on all of us uh, throughout the industry. Same thing, if you're able to shave off a millimeter here or a centimeter there, how much does that support in uh, reducing the price as well for, the, uh, for us that then we pass on to the consumer? 
Um, and this is something that we put a, a lot of energy in, not just back in six, seven, and eight when I was part of it, but something that is an ongoing approach to uh, reduce the uh, overall prices of our goods. In fact, over the last 12 months, we've lowered the price on over 1,000 uh, articles. And within uh, a week, we'll reduce the price on an additional 500 articles as well. So it is something that we continually try um, to uh, take and, and lower the price. We know the consumer today has a very tight wallet. The economic challenges that we face as companies, we all face as consumers as well. And the more we can lower the prices, do be able to uh, bring uh, more affordable home furnishings and allow the customer to have a better life at home as well. So continuing to focus on the affordability side. But then looking at uh, accessibility. So accessibility, we have been known over the years for the big blue box. Um, many of you hopefully have been to an IKEA. They average around uh, 300,000 square feet. Um, some of the st store I started in outside of uh, Chicago um, was actually 450,000 square feet. So there is quite a, a range, but normally 300,000 plus. As we look at accessibility across the US, we've now started to change our uh, mindset. Like I said, the more we want retail to stay the same, the more we need to change. And this is what we've been focused on a lot in accessibility, is how do we get closer to the consumer? You can imagine a big blue box of 300,000 square feet. There are only so many markets that we can get into, and only so many of those we can put within each market. So uh, we've been uh, working hard across the globe to see how can we adapt and adjust. And what you see here is the one we opened up uh, downtown San Francisco. Um, Unfortunately, it was, uh, we purchased the site right before COVID hit, so uh, timing like the bookstore last night um, may not have been best, but uh, we see it starting to really come to fruition in a good way. This store is about 70,000 square feet uh, in total, and um, we've been looking at a lot more solutions right around 100,000 square feet that can get, uh, the existing markets can start to bring uh, additional locations, but also get us into cities uh, that we haven't been able to penetrate uh, before um, with this smaller format. At the same time, we're looking at what we call plan and order point. This is actually uh, much smaller, uh, some as small as 1,000 square feet, um, where we're going in and have uh, uh, planning tables, plan kitchens, plan your closet, plan your entertainment solution, and, and uh, different aspects. Um, where uh, we're much more into the suburbs and in, into some of the smaller markets, but then also have uh, a pickup location attached. So you can still order the full range of goods uh, online or in the store and then come pick it up uh, tomorrow or the next day uh, as we go through. So this is uh, one avenue that we see that can really get us closer uh, to the consumer in many different uh, markets as well across. We, uh, if you take Texas here, we've opened one in um, South Lake, just outside of Dallas. We've also opened uh, one in uh, Katy, right outside of Houston. And we're in the midst of building one uh, right here at the Domain uh, in the Austin market. And then quite a few around the DC market and the LA market already, but plans to open uh, many more of these across uh, the US as well. This still only takes us so far. So the other piece of creating that accessibility for the consumer is actually around services and around final mile. So taking the opportunity to um, improve the services, we have uh, acquired a company that does uh, assembly. So TaskRabbit uh, is a company that we acquired four or five years ago, actually a little longer than that, I think that uh, does assembly. We'll come to the consumer's home, assemble the goods for them, and, and help out. We've also acquired a kitchen installation company, uh, now called IKEA Home Services, that is able to also both come to the home and plan. So creating that accessibility, the customer doesn't have to leave the house. They can come in and uh, measure the kitchen, and then we uh, plan the kitchen either in a store or remotely uh, over the phone as well. I've personally done that with my son's kitchen. Uh, did it all over the phone. I wanted to test it and see uh, how that works. I couldn't imagine buying a kitchen over the phone. 
but uh, it worked extremely well. Um, and uh, then him and I installed it ourselves together, actually. So we didn't use the installation service yet, uh, but I will test that out in the near future on, on uh, my kitchen as well. Um, and then we've also worked around uh, how do we balance from an accessibility, that digital and, and physical standpoint, with um, uh, home, fur home furnishing design. So we acquired a company called Geomagical that uh, now in our app, you can take a photo of your living room. It's called Creative. Um, and uh, take your sofa out, put a new sofa in, take out your TV solution, put a new TV solution in, et cetera, and see how it'll look in your home as well. Um, and then continuing to expand the uh, tools to help create uh, designs um, beyond kitchen uh, at your home as well. And then also something um, that may resonate with you guys a little bit as well is IKEA Business Network, where we help businesses um, plan out uh, their solutions, uh, whether it be using our materials to do their, uh, their solutions or inside their offices to uh, help as well. And that's something that's just growing. Uh, had an opportunity to meet with the Atlantic Business uh, Convention in the Northeast uh, last week, where we were able to dig into this and see how we can really connect with uh, businesses in a good way. But then the, the fastest and most rapid approach we're doing to accessibility is as simple as pickup points. So creating a solution where the online consumer can uh, purchase their goods, but then uh, not have it delivered all the way to their house save uh, both the environment and themselves a little bit of uh, money and pick it up. So we have 21,000 uh, FedEx points across the uh, US that a uh, consumer can pick up the smaller, more market haul, your pillows, your throws, et cetera, type of goods. But then also now um, 55, soon to be 71 uh, furniture pickup points uh, across the US and uh, starting to see how we can go even faster on that piece because that's the hardest piece to uh, get through which also helps us again, as I mentioned, on the sustainability side, but also on the convenience side for the consumer. So those were two roads, the affordability road and the accessibility road that we focus on. And the last one that I wanted to spend a little bit more time on with you is around the, um, the uh, sustainability side. So uh, we started many years ago working on uh, how do we offset. Um, and so we did purchase a couple wind farms. We have one uh, going straight south, Cameron County, Texas, uh, as well as up in Hoopston, Illinois, um, along with uh, solar farms that we have uh, across the US as well. But then uh, we moved to see, instead of offsetting, how do we actually make sure that we are utilizing um, the renewable solutions as well. And uh, the way we did that a little bit, uh, you know, around test and try, which is something that uh, we pride ourselves on in order to really learn and move forward. We know we need to test and try. We don't have all the answers. So we need to partner together. Um, one aspect actually I'll highlight, because we just did this a uh, week ago as well, and a couple people here were there with us actually. We have uh, started back in 2019 a program called One Home, One Planet where we bring people from all over different industries, um, different um, solutions together to brainstorm and work through topics that uh, none of us have the answer to. I think as we dig into sustainability, the smartest move we made is realize that we're not smart enough. We don't have all the answers ourselves. And uh, so we started, like I said, back in 2019, globally, and then we've done a few here domestically, the latest being last week. We bring people together around different topics. So this last week we focused on affordable housing. How do we help really the many uh, people find a place to live? The, too many people are out on the streets today. Uh, circularity, how do we take uh, what is old and make it new again? And then uh, clean construction, uh, where we come together and see how do we really move construction to an area where we have a net zero impact. Uh, and of course, none of us have that answer today. At least to my knowledge, if you do, please let me know. We're, we're quite intrigued and interested to hear. Um, but so we, we've come together from that aspect to try to learn with many others, but also to test and try ourselves. So back in 2009 was the first time we started working with solar panels on the roof of our uh, stores. And in the Brooklyn store, we brought in four different solutions, 
put them on the roof and, and tested and tried for uh, about a year before we were able to identify the best way forward for us. And now we have over 90% of our locations with uh, PV or solar uh, array, both on our rooftop but also in our uh, carports. I think I have a picture here of uh, carports. So our Paramus store um, has gone through and done a, a complete solution. So they have a parking deck of uh, three floors. And then on the top deck is now all covered with uh, the carport. It's fantastic for the consumers as well because then they're uh, out of the weather mostly. Of course, a little bit gets through, but out of the weather mostly. And then, of course, the energy that it brings uh, to the site. We've actually gone as far in some locations, like this one here in Baltimore, where we produce more electricity than we actually use. Uh, that will change, because we're also in the midst of changing uh, renewable heating and cooling. So uh, right now, many of our buildings still have older uh, solutions for uh, heating and cooling. And at end of life, we're updating all of them to be renewable heating and cooling. We have five in process right now uh, that are being updated. In fact, uh, Round Rock, right outside of Austin here, uh, has already had their units switched out. And they're in the final stages. By June, they'll be 100% um, switched out. And then uh, we have another five lined up after that, and so on and so forth. We have 51 locations to get through. So it's going to take us a little bit of time. But that's part of our goal as we strive towards uh, 2030, is how to get to that solution. We also um, continue to test and try in different aspects as well. One, uh, this actually is less of a test and try, but EV solutions. We have um, just read an article. I didn't even know it uh, myself, but apparently we're, we have the most EV solutions of any retailer um, across the US. So that article just came out uh, last week. I still have to read it to validate everything, so don't quote me on that one yet, because <laughs> I hadn't heard that officially. But uh, that article had just come out. Um, and we're doing it both from the customer side, but also from the final mile for the fulfillment side as well. That's one of our most challenging goals domestically to get through, is we want to have all of our home deliveries to be done through EV by 2025. It's one thing to do that in Germany, where we're much more uh, tight, uh, tightly fit from a um, customer base, as well as from our store locations. But you can imagine if we deliver something to Montana, that's a little bit more challenging than if we deliver something to uh, the suburbs of Chicago or the suburbs of uh, you know, Austin, where it's a little bit more achievable. So we still have some ways to go. We haven't completely figured everything out yet, but uh, our first effort is to make sure that everything within 30 minutes and then 60 minutes of our location we tackle first and then figure out how to uh, go further as well. Um, the other piece where we're testing and trying is uh, some new technologies. So I'm sure, as many of you, we're hearing everything that AI is going to do for us. Uh, can't wait to learn all of it uh, and, and see what it unfolds. One area that we uh, started to dabble in actually two years ago now, I think it was, or three years ago, is artificial intelligence that hooks up to the building management systems uh, in our stores and uh, helps moderate the heating and cooling based on weather patterns, based on um, traffic flow that we're expecting in the stores, knowing what time we're going to open and close, when we're going to start operations in the restaurant, et cetera, et cetera. So it is continually learning uh, what's happening and uh, reduces energy usage, for us at least, about 5% in the locations that we've put it in. So with sustainability, we try to hit both how do we reduce but then also, how do we create uh, the, on the renewable side to really give us a good uh, balance overall? Um, and then uh, the other is around um, reduction of waste and uh, recycling. One thing that came out of the uh, OHOP, One Home, One Planet, from 2019 is a program uh, called Buy Back and Resell. So what we've started uh, doing, and it's not in all the states yet, there's some... Uh, uh, legislation restrictions in some markets that we're still working through. But in most of our locations, you can bring back a uh, product that you uh, used, don't need anymore. We will buy it back from you, and then we will resell it in our as-is department uh, so a customer can have a second-hand solution. Of course, that helps from a couple different aspects. It reduces the uh, waste and the impact uh, to the market 
but also uh, it helps from an affordability standpoint. You can imagine this uh, solution here that was uh, already used is going to sell at a lower price than if you buy this uh, brand new as well. So it gives an opportunity to help the consumer from an affordability, but also help from a sustainability uh, aspect. Um, I think the key message before we sit down and take some questions is uh, just uh, going back a little bit to what uh, Ryan had said uh, last night around uh, the need in order to stay the same, we need to change. And uh, that's continually what we're looking at uh, as a company. And hopefully, with this, are able to really penetrate much deeper, get much closer to the consumers, to each of you, and uh, do it in a very uh, sustainable way as well. So thank you. Okay. Awesome. Excellent. Yep. Take a seat. Yeah. Thanks. Rob, thank you so much. That was a really comprehensive overview of what you guys are up to. And it's... Thank you. Um, Especially the efforts around sustainability, it's, it's just the, the commitment to that is very impressive. I want to take a big step backwards, though. Um, anyone who's taken a, a quick flick through your LinkedIn knows that you've had quite a, an interesting career path. Um, I won't say how long it was, but you started in ago, but you, you started at Walmart, yep. which you had to assistant store manager, eventually ended up uh, at IKEA 26 years ago, mm -hmm. and you've held uh, a bunch of different roles uh, in Sweden as well. You were in real estate, uh, CFO, now COO. One, you're a retail lifer. Um, and then secondly, I guess, what, what's it like, what's the culture like at IKEA that you've had that kind of diversity in your career there? Yeah, I think maybe first on retail. I, I actually didn't plan to end up in retail. Okay. I had, uh, was working Walmart to uh, pay for university. And uh, then uh, upon graduation, had an offer, uh, first an internship, which gave me a few school credits to, uh, to be able to graduate on, on time. But then uh, I got into retail and just fell in love. Uh, just uh, originally wanted to be an accountant, but realized, no offense to anybody, but I just couldn't sit in, at a desk and, and do that. So I needed something with a little bit more activity and, and action. And that's how I fell into retail. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when I interviewed at, at Walmart, I remember telling my wife, I came home uh, from the interview, and I wasn't even in the job market. My district manager at uh, Sport Mart had uh, interviewed with them, and uh, the role um, that she interviewed for, she had just accepted another position and said, you know, that that's Rob. And so I actually had given him my name before she asked me. And then she came uh, home and called me right away. And she's like, I hope you don't mind. I've just interviewed with this company. And I really think you'd be perfect for this role. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was grew up outside of Chicago. So it was in the Midwest. Ikea was not there yet. And I'm like, well, I've never thought about selling cars, but I'll, you know, I'll go listen. I thought she said Kia. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I respected her so much. I'm like, fine, I'll go listen. And, and then she explained uh, what Ikea was. And when I came home from that interview, I, I told my wife, I'm like, if half of what they tell me is true, I'm going. Um, and it is. It's just, uh, again, growing up in the Midwest, the Swedish uh, culture and values uh, that IKEA brings to the table fit hand in hand uh, with my own culture and values and uh, just uh, really uh, made it feel like home uh, from that aspect. And then, you know, we really work about uh, hiring for values and, and hiring for uh, potential versus hiring for uh, a degree or, or, you know, your specialty. We do both, of course, where needed. Um, and that's how I ended up getting into the, um, the CFO role originally. I had been in the stores my whole life and then had... Um, come to the service office doing more of a regional type role. And uh, then the opportunity came up. I had a little bit of background because I, I did start focusing on accounting uh, in, in university. And then um, got into this and was heavily focused operationally from the stores. Right. And that was what we needed at the time in the US was to really help enhance operations. And so uh, you know, they came to me and asked if I wanted to do that role. And I said, why not? And gave it a shot. And it worked out uh, pretty well. Um, and then the real estate role uh, was very similar. I had worked heavily with the expansion that we had here in the US as well. 
Um, so I was uh, connected and, and quite aware. And the role came globally and uh, with my background of finding efficiencies and, and working through different aspects, they'd asked me to take that opportunity as well. Um, right. And then came back here two and a half years ago in the, this role. Okay. Well, so, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I wanted to sort of highlight that because, you know, talking to you, it's very apparent just how, you know, across everything, this, this you live and breathe this company, uh, and it's, and I want to touch on a few of the things there, um, just aspects. Starting with the sustainability piece, uh, obviously that connection to Sweden and Europe and you know, just how forward thinking they are over there and on this front. Um, how much does that sort of inform everything? And, and I guess compared, when you look at retail as a whole, I mean, you guys are obviously making a lot of investments and even the sort of buyback and resale program yep. is, a, is a big example of that. Do you think enough's happening in the US to sort of uh, you know, really make a dent in this huge issue that we're facing looking ahead? I think globally we're not uh, far enough ahead yet, no. Um, whether U.S. or global, I think we still have a long way to go uh, in order to really offset the, uh, you know, the, the need from a sustainability aspect. Uh, but I think we're moving in a good way. Uh, it's, we start to see more and more countries, more and more companies coming together and a partner together like the OHOP example I gave. This is happening, you know, back at COP, back at uh, Climate Week, uh, and many different aspects where companies are coming together, and we are finding a way. So I'm quite optimistic that we're going to get there. Um, is it as fast as we should? Probably not. Uh, will it be fast enough? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> I think so. And is it, you know, you'd asked, is it, you know, Swedish or European? Definitely our Swedish roots play into it. Uh, we've always been very focused on, um, you know, both sustainability but also efficiencies. I can think back to uh, when I first started, um, actually a year before I joined. I joined in uh, 1998. Uh, the summer prior in 97 was, if you remember all the stuffed animals uh, with the eyes, it started becoming a choking hazard uh, back in that time frame. And Ikea was selling a line of stuffed animals as well and immediately pulled them off the shelves and uh, stopped their orders that they had. And um, instead of just letting the supplier deal with it and probably going out of business, came together on the factory floor and really worked through to see what can we do with, uh, with these uh, um, products. And instead of wasting all of it, reused everything, created a line called Famning. is the heart. I don't know if you remember the red heart with the arms hanging out. Um, and there was a moon and the, and the sun. And just redesigned everything, saved the company, the supplier, from uh, having to go bankrupt, and then also from a sustainability, reused all the material. Um, so it's a mindset that we've had uh, even before I joined the company, for sure, um, and something that we continue to take forward. And I do think it comes from the Swedish roots uh, within there, yes. Wow, really interesting. And just a, an impressive level of ingenuity. Um, and I'm going to switch gears here now. And yeah. I do that, sorry. But uh, we've got a lot to cover and not much time to get there. Yeah. Um, just applying that ingenuity to the future and uh, the, plan and, uh, the plan and order points. Yep. Um, I, I, great sort of direction. I, obviously, it's a, an example of how you're evolving the brand and meeting customer needs. It's obviously so diff different, though, from the, the big box experience. So how do you go about you know, thinking about creating that experience and translating that iconic experience into something like this that's new and you know it's just getting off the ground right now yeah I think it's a little bit of creating a community you know if we were to go open a plan and order point in Birmingham Alabama where we don't have a solution nearby I don't think it would work um, so I think it is about taking the markets that we're in or close enough markets that we're in to then start to do solutions like this uh, further out. So it creates that accessibility. We, we grew up as a destination retailer. So everybody would come to us and, and uh, we actually called it a fun day out with the family. They would spend the day, we had a ball area that the kids could play in, it's called Small Land, restaurants, et cetera. But uh, the consumer is doing less and less of that now. So we need to create those uh, solutions that are close by. They're not going to give you the full experience, mm -hmm. but they're still going to give you uh, the pieces that you need. And then once or twice a year, you can still go to the uh, big blue box for the full experience as well. So I think it is the balance of making sure that it is where our brand awareness is high enough, mm -hmm. um, that the consumer understands what they're getting. We definitely still get people that come in confused. 
trying to figure out where the you know where everything else is at uh, when they get into the location. Right. Um, and we've also you know I talk about testing and trying. We made a mistake. The first two we opened here in the U.S. were in the L.A. market. And uh, we opened them without any collection. So it was just planning. Right. Um, and then uh, the consumer quickly told us that that was wrong, that, okay. <laughs> that they need to be able to pick up their goods. I'm not going to leave well. with the product, you know? Like, <laughs> exactly. Okay. So, uh, so then we quickly started to bring that in. So all the new solutions going forward have it. And then we're starting to adapt the, uh, the two in LA so they have it as well. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I, and um, it's in, it, that. Trying different things is that, that task rabbit thing was very interesting. You guys acquired task rabbit. I didn't know that. Yep. We can't even get people to uh, assemble their own flat pack <laughs> furniture anymore. Apparently no. not. Right. Okay. <laughs> no. And and just thinking on this uh, line as well in terms of what you're planning for the future, the the small stores. So the yep. uh, not the plan and order, but the hundred thousand square yep. foot and below, like it's in San Fran. Um, how big a part is that going to play in your growth strategy moving forward? Now, obviously. Uh, I'm assuming it's going to allow you to go into spaces that already exist as opposed to ground up um, construction. So do you have an idea of what, how, how, you know, how many of those there might be looking ahead? Yeah, I think, I don't know if I want to give an exact number, but what I, what I will say is that uh, we see that as a majority of our growth in the U.S. going forward. Um, so we will be able to get into a lot of the markets that we don't exist today. Um, so you could uh, see quite a few coming, I think, over the next few years. Mm -hmm. And then from, uh, you know, instead of ground up, some will still be ground up, but the majority we are looking, and, and also this is heavily due to a sustainability mindset as well, is to reuse. I mean, uh, you know, I mentioned in OHOP we did, uh, one of the topics was clean construction, and uh, the cleanest construction is none. Mm -hmm. So if we're able to take an existing JCPenney, Sears, whatever uh, location and reuse it, uh, it is much more sustainable, even if we go in without the renewable heating and cooling or without the photovoltaic solution, because we didn't have to uh, build from the ground up, it is a much more sustainable solution. Okay. So, uh, so definitely, we'll be looking for a lot of reuse, um, working with uh, some you know, great real estate partners, helping us find some of those spots as well. So, okay. yeah. Excellent. Um, and I, we'll get to some audience questions in just a bit. Uh, I guess, you know, as you think about the future IKEA experience um, on all facets, but I guess particularly in, the, in physical retail, what keeps you up at night? You know, what's the thing that kind of you, you have your, you're bashing your head against the wall about when it comes to the future of that? Yeah, I think um, it's how to optimize our existing assets. Um, so there has been and will continue to be a transition to uh, digital. Um, in fact, for us, over 30% of our sales now are uh, digital um, across the US, and that continues to grow. We have some locations as high as 50%. So when you get into New York City, we have some that are 50-50 split. Um, and with that, a 300, 400,000 square foot building isn't as necessary as it was uh, five years ago, 10 years ago. So I, I think it is uh, how do we optimize uh, those assets? And what we've started to do is, uh, again, focus on that final mile I mentioned earlier around transitioning quite a few of them to uh, fulfillment solutions. Okay. So we have uh, 26 projects across the US right now where we'll take um, half of our stores and uh, shrink a little bit inside commercially and expand from a fulfillment aspect uh, to be able to take care and, and also um, be quicker for the consumer, but also more sustainable for the consumer in getting the goods to them. Um, and that'll take care of most, but there's still others that uh, we haven't figured out exactly how to do it, uh, where we probably need to shrink and maybe lease out to some other retailers or some other solutions that we can bring into the building. So I think. That's what keeps me up, is trying to figure out how do we use our existing assets in an ever-changing and evolving uh, retail market. Interesting. And I guess, what else are you doing to maybe lift foot traffic into, the, into those bigger spaces? Yeah, so we've actually, we've been working with our, uh, we call market managers or store managers quite a bit to see how do we uh, really drive the traffic. One is through affordability. So with the new lower prices by uh, marketing, really making sure the consumer knows that we're lowering our prices in an environment when many are not. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully drawing people in from that aspect. 
but also giving a reason to come to the store. So as simple as um, bingo nights, you know, during the week where we'll have many of our locations, we'll do uh, bingo, invite people into the restaurant, sit down, play some games, have some fun. Uh, we do dock sales where we'll take um, and, and use our receiving dock and, and once in a while do an event where we, again, try to drive people in from that aspect. Um, different seminars, uh, as simple as teaching people how to set the table during the holiday to, you know, more, uh, you know, sustainable, like uh, plant, uh, you know, planting a plant and working with kids from that aspect. So okay. just different approaches, trying to see how can we get the consumer uh, to come in more often or to come in instead of shopping online. What kind of what kind of numbers do you pull on a bingo night at, at IKEA? Surprisingly, quite a few. Right. I, when okay. I first heard about it, I was a little skeptical. But uh, <laughs> you know, our Paramus store has been uh, New Jersey has been right. doing it the longest, and I think if I'm trying to remember, the 150, 170 people that they've had in a couple of them. So it's quite okay. a few people that come in for bingo. It, wow. it draws quite okay. a bit of attention. Right. <laughs> so, okay. That's fascinating. Yes. I heard somewhere through the grapevine you might be getting hot dogs as well. We've had some hot dogs. Okay. Uh, we are getting actually, um, so we have a, we've had forever the regular hot dog, okay. one, of, one of our best selling items actually, that okay. and meatballs. Um, but now we've brought in a veggie dog okay. and uh, also uh, just started in the last week a plant dog. Um, and I, I have to say, you know, I, I support the, the movement from a vegetarian standpoint. However, I haven't been successful. I did try for two weeks. Um, my son has done much better than me at that, but um, I've tried the plant dog and it is uh, fantastic. I, I honestly couldn't tell you the difference mm -hmm. between the uh, regular hot dog and the plant dog. Um, okay. So it's just come out and we've, of course, priced it accordingly. You can get the veggie dog at 65 cents, the plant dog at 70, and if you still want the traditional hot dog, then it is a little bit more at 75. So, okay, there you go, everybody. Um, I do have, just sorry, one last thing that I want yeah. to ask before I, I open it up just for the last couple of minutes. And you, we're just going back to this idea of what to do with that main asset. I mean, that, the, the big box experience is so iconic. You know, it's, the maze is just from a, you know, a brick and mortar design perspective is nothing short of legendary. But I mean, for, I know personally for me, like I've only ever been to an Ikea three times in my life. You know, when it's moving time, a milestone where I'm yep. relocating. Uh, I guess, you know, you've been with the company so long, um, and this industry, more than other industries, I think, is well aware of the fact that nothing is a sure thing ever. What's, how do you think about that maze, big box, you know, just really iconic experience 20 to 30 years from now? Is that going to, is it still going to exist? Yeah, maybe... Um Two different answers to that. First, to start with uh, the need for physical. And I think we've got a couple topics later today that I'm quite intrigued to uh, listen to. Um, I think there will always be a need for a physical solution, yes. Um, you know, I was telling somebody at breakfast this morning, we, um, we've done a study, and even though we've moved to uh, 30, a little over 30% online sales, 75% of the customers that buy a sofa online come to the store first and sit in it. Um, so I think the physical need will always be there. And then the maze, or we call it the long natural way. Um, <laughs> it, it, you know, <laughs> The long actual way? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, I, I think back to one of my first lessons uh, in retail just after Walmart when I was with Sportmart, uh, sporting goods company, obviously, and you know, the movement towards add-on sales uh, was always being discussed. Yeah. And um, one of my old managers gave me a different way to think about it. You know, we think of ad on sales potentially as being greedy as a retailer trying to get people to buy more. But in reality, it's trying to make sure the customer has a full solution. Whether it be home furnishings like Ikea, making sure that you don't just buy the sofa and then you don't have a throw and a pillow to go with it. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, back in sporting goods, guy comes in, going golfing with his boss, never been golfing before. He comes in to get a golf set. You sell him a set of tailor-mades. Perfect. He leaves. He gets to the course. He doesn't have a bag. He's carrying it in a box. Needs a doesn't glove. have tees, yeah. doesn't have balls, doesn't have a glove, mm -hmm. shoes, etc. So it, you know, the thing that the uh, long natural path does is it allows the customer to experience the totality of the range and make sure that they get a co complete solution 
when they leave versus getting home and having that sofa and then they're cold because uh, their spouse has the air conditioning on at 65 degrees and they like it at 72. So it is, uh, it is really about helping create that full solution. So I think it'll still be here down the road as well. Good to know, okay. Yep. Uh, we look, who's got a really good question that they'd like to throw up here? We've got time for one question. <laughs> make, it, make it a good one if someone has one. Someone's got a really good question. Oh yeah, we've got one over here. There we go. Hey Rob, so I recently uh, built out two of our closets in our yeah. house, so redid the whole bedrooms. And uh, just a comment, um, the design on your website to plan out the closet organizers was phenomenal, by oh, the way. Oh, thank you. But my question was, I noticed that a lot of the material, because I live up in Dallas, so I was, I was drawn out of the Frisco yep. store. Um, a lot of the products I was looking for were out of stock. And so my imagination kind of went wild. I was like, are they just killing it in these locations, selling out? Or is there some type of supply issue going on? Or, or what was going on there? So just maybe a supply um, question. How are you guys doing with your supply chain? Definitely. I think, um, you know, maybe to go back a few years and then go to current, all of us went through quite a bit of challenge uh, during COVID. And then, of course, the port uh, blocks that we had uh, during that same time frame. So we struggled for a while to uh, get supply to the right level. Um, and then uh, recently, uh, the majority has gotten much better. Uh, but we do have a few categories that we've been struggling in. Part of, you may have heard uh, about a year ago, we've chosen to invest $2.2 .2 billion here in the US. A lot of that is around the physical expansion as well as the digital, but a lot of it's also around the supply chain. So we are looking for um, suppliers more closer to the US um, to be able to work with. Um, the closet, I'm guessing you might have used PAX um, as your solution. So we're in the midst of transitioning to a new setup with PAX um, where it'll be lighter weight and uh, actually much easier to assemble. So apologies, it probably took you, as it did me, I did uh, two closets myself. It took a bit of time to assemble, but uh, the new solution, which comes in July, will be, uh, you can put it up in like 10 minutes. Uh, it's amazing how quick it uh, goes. So it, since we are in the transition the, in the PAX range, uh, we have had a few stock issues as we're trying to finish up the, uh, the current range to move into the new range in July. Yeah. Thank you. Rob, yep. this is so cool. We are out of time, but what a wonderful way to kick off Monday here at Retail Spaces. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate it.